Bradley, what is this? Again? You're not listening to me, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. Bradley barely glanced up from his phone. Why should I? You're not my mom. I don't have to listen to you. His words stung, but I forced myself to stay steady. I had been married to Sean for four years now, and dealing with Bradley's rebellion had become a daily struggle. Sean's mother, Carol, standing in the doorway, watched the exchange without a word, her expression one of mild amusement. Bradley, this isn't about me being your mom. It's about respect, I said, my patience wearing thin. Whatever, he muttered, grabbing his backpack and heading for the door. I sighed and turned to Carol. Can you please help me with him, Carol? He needs boundaries. He's a teenager, Valerie, Carol said dismissively. You need to give him some space. Bradley slammed the door on his way out, and I flinched. Carol looked at me like I was the one at fault. Every day felt like a battle, and I was losing. Later, Sean walked in from work, dropping his keys on the kitchen counter. Hey, Val, what's for dinner? I sighed. I was thinking of leftovers, Sean. We need to start saving money. Bradley's demands and Carol's shopping are getting out of hand. Sean frowned. Val, we've been over this. They're my family. We can't just change how things are overnight. No, I said, my voice rising despite myself. But we have to start somewhere. I can't keep doing this alone. You're overreacting. Stop worrying so much. We'll manage, Sean said dismissively. I turned away, frustrated. I felt more like a maid than part of this family, juggling the household finances and trying to make ends meet. Even with my job, covering the endless expenses was impossible when no one else seemed to care. That evening, I found Carol reclining in the living room, surrounded by shopping bags. Did you go shopping again? I asked, unable to hide the irritation in my voice. Carol looked up, unbothered. Just a few things. Bradley needed new shoes, and I saw a nice jacket for him. Carol... We can't afford this. We're already struggling to pay the bills, I said. We'll be fine, Valerie. Don't be so dramatic, she replied. As I tried to argue, Sean stepped in. What's the problem now? We can't keep spending like this, Sean. It's not sustainable. He looked tired. You're always making a big deal out of everything. Just let it go. I felt a wave of anger and helplessness wash over me. How could they not see what was happening? The next morning I tried speaking to Bradley again before he left for school. Bradley, we need to talk about your attitude and spending habits. Leave me alone, he said, pushing past me. The door slammed shut again. In the quiet of the house I sat down, feeling the weight of it all pressing on me. If something didn't change soon, I would break. As I looked around the house, filled with things we didn't need and couldn't afford, a sinking realization set in. I was invisible here, and my words fell on deaf ears. I stood up, and walked to the little home office where I kept the bills. It was time to stop talking and start doing something about this mess. The next morning, as I placed a plate of scrambled eggs in front of Bradley, he gave me a disdainful look. I'm not eating that, he said, pushing the plate away. It's perfectly good food, Bradley. We can't afford to be wasteful, I replied, trying to stay calm. I'm not eating leftovers, he snapped. Why can't we ever have something fresh? Just then, Carol walked into the kitchen. Bradley, darling, you don't have to eat that if you don't want to. We can go out for breakfast, she said, putting a hand on his shoulder. Carol, we can't keep spending money like this, I said firmly. We need to be more responsible. She dismissed my concerns with a wave. You worry too much, Valerie. We'll be fine. Frustration bubbled up inside me. No, we won't be fine. We need to start cutting back now. Our financial situation is serious. Carol smirked. You're overreacting. Sean will take care of everything. He always does. I wanted to scream. Later, Sean walked in and I seized the moment. Sean, we need to talk about the spending. Carol and Bradley are not listening. This can't go on. Sean sighed, looking weary. Can we talk about this later, Val? It's too early for arguments. I grabbed a stack of bills from the counter. No, we need to talk now. Look at these. We're drowning and no one is helping. He glanced at the bills, then back at me. Val, you stress too much. We'll get through it. How, Sean? By ignoring the problem and hoping it goes away? We need to set limits, and it starts with Bradley and Carol. He rubbed his temples. I'm tired, Val. Just let it go for now. Fuming, I left the kitchen, feeling more isolated than ever. No one was listening. That evening, I tried to talk to Bradley again while he was playing video games. Bradley, can we talk? 
he didn't even pause the game. About what? How you're going to tell me to stop having fun? This isn't about fun, Bradley. It's about responsibility. We need to work together as a family. Whatever, Valerie, he said, eyes glued to the screen. Bradley, this is serious. We need to make changes. Your behavior affects everyone. He finally looked at me, irritation clear on his face. I'm not changing for you. Deal with it. As I walked away, I passed Carol, who had been listening. You need to stop pushing him, Valerie. You're making things worse. I'm trying to help. We can't keep pretending everything is fine. You're the one causing problems, she said coldly before turning away. The days passed and the tension in the house grew thicker. One afternoon I found Carol in the living room, arranging a pile of shopping bags. Carol, more shopping? We've talked about this. She shrugged, not bothered. Bradley needed new clothes. He's a growing boy. That we can't afford new clothes constantly. There are more important things we need to focus on. Sean said it's fine, she replied nonchalantly. Infuriated, I cornered Sean that night after dinner. Sean, enough is enough. We need to set boundaries. He looked exhausted and annoyed. What do you want me to do, Val? They won't listen to you, and they won't listen to me either. Then we'll sink. Is that what you want? I asked, my voice trembling. Sean didn't have an answer. As I watched him retreat into silence, something broke inside me. If they wouldn't change, maybe it was time I did. Ever since our last argument, a heavy silence filled the house. That silence broke when I walked into the living room one afternoon and saw Bradley tearing open a large box. What's that? I asked, already dreading the answer. Bradley's eyes lit up. A new gaming console. Grandma bought it for me. My heart sank. How could Carol keep doing this? I turned to find her standing in the doorway, her expression smug. Carol, we cannot keep buying expensive things. We have bills to pay. Carol crossed her arms. Valerie, it's a small gift. Bradley's been having a hard time. He deserves something nice. We can't afford nice right now, Carol. You know that. Don't be such a stick in the mud, Valerie. He's just a kid. I was furious. Enough, Carol. This kind of spending is sinking us. Sean walked in just as I was about to snap. What's going on? Carol bought Bradley a new gaming console, I said, shaking with anger. Sean rubbed his forehead. Val, can we not fight over this? Let's talk about it later. There's nothing to talk about, Sean. We need to make changes now. This isn't sustainable. He sighed, looking between Carol and me. We'll figure it out. I stormed out of the room, feeling utterly defeated. They were never going to change, and I was hitting a wall every single time. The next morning, I decided to take action. I waited until Bradley left for school and Carol went out shopping. Then I sat Sean down at the kitchen table. Sean, we need to make some serious changes. This is out of control, I began, trying to keep my voice steady. Valerie, I know you're struggling, but what do you expect me to do? He asked, exasperated. You need to start supporting me. Put your foot down with Carol and Bradley. We need to budget and stick to it. I'll talk to them, he said warily, but I had heard that before. No, Sean, you need to do more than talk. You need to enforce it, I said firmly. He looked at me for a long moment. I'll try, he finally said. But try wasn't enough. The following week, nothing changed. Carol continued her shopping sprees, and Bradley kept getting what he wanted. I felt like I was sinking into quicksand. Then, one evening, I overheard Carol talking to a friend on the phone. Valerie's always nagging about money. She needs to relax. Sean will take care of everything like he always does. That was the last straw. I waited until she hung up before confronting her. Carol, enough is enough. You can't keep treating this situation lightly. We need to stop this reckless spending. Carol looked at me with contempt. Valerie, you're overstepping. Who do you think you are? This is my son's house. It's my house, too, and I have a say in how we manage it. Sean's in charge, and he'll make the decisions. Not you, she said, glaring at me. I turned to Sean, who had been standing silently in the doorway. Are you going to let her speak for you? He looked uncomfortable. Val, let's just calm down. We can talk about this. No, Sean. We've talked enough. This has to stop now. Carol smirked. See, Sean? Valerie's just causing trouble. I felt the walls closing in. Without more support from Sean, nothing would change. It was up to me to decide what my breaking point was and what I was willing to tolerate. That night, as I lay in bed staring at the ceiling, I made up my mind. Sean might not back me up, but I had to stand my ground. 
This cycle had to end one way or another. The tension in the house reached a boiling point the next morning. Carol was in the kitchen, humming softly to herself as she brewed coffee. Bradley was shoveling cereal into his mouth, ignoring me as usual. I took a deep breath and walked over to the coffee machine. Carol, we need to talk. She glanced at me, raising an eyebrow. What now, Valerie? I kept my voice steady. This can't go on. The spending, the disrespect, we're in a financial crisis and no one is listening. Valerie, is this really necessary? You're blowing things out of proportion, she said, her tone dripping with condescension. I'm not, I said firmly. Sean and I have talked, and we need to make some drastic changes. Carol scoffed. Talked? He'll come to his senses like he always does. You can't change how we live. Actually, I can, I replied. I'm not moving into the new house. Gosh, this has gone too far. I've had enough. The room went silent. Even Bradley looked up from his cereal. You can't be serious, Carol said, her voice rising. Sean, tell her she's being ridiculous. Sean stood in the doorway, looking helpless. Val, are you sure this is what you want? I nodded. I've thought about it, Sean. I'm done enabling this behavior. I need a break from all of this. You can't just leave, Bradley said, standing up. Who's going to handle everything? This I'm sure you'll manage, I replied, keeping my voice calm. Sean stepped forward. Valerie, we're a family. You can't just walk out. Watch me, I said. The determination in my voice surprised even me. That night, I packed my bags. Every creak of the suitcase zipper sounded louder in the quiet house. Sean came into the bedroom and sat on the edge of the bed. Val, please reconsider. We can make things better. I've given it four years. Nothing's changed. I need to take care of myself now. How can you do this to us? To me? His voice broke, and for a moment, I saw the vulnerability in his eyes that I'd fallen in love with. But it wasn't enough to hold me back this time. I'm doing this for me, Sean. I need space, and I need peace. With my bags packed, I stood at the door. Bradley stormed past me, his face twisted with anger. You're just a quitter, he spat. I ignored the sting of his words and walked out, feeling a strange mix of sadness and relief. In the new apartment, the silence was different. Peaceful, almost welcoming. As the days went by, I started to find a rhythm, a sense of self that had been lost in the chaos. Back at the old house, things began to unravel. I received a call from Sean late one evening. Valerie, we need you. Things are falling apart here. His voice was laced with panic. You need to handle it, Sean. I've done my part. Please, can you at least think about coming back? I can't, Sean. You need to face the consequences of your choices. I need to move on. As I hung up the phone, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. For the first time in years, I slept soundly, knowing I had finally taken control of my life. I closed the door to my new apartment with a sense of resolve. The place was small but clean, a blank canvas ready for a fresh start. I began to unpack my life, each item a reminder of what I had left behind. Sean's calls were increasingly desperate. Val, we can't manage without you. The bills are piling up. The house is a mess, he confessed during one of our conversations. Sean, you need to step up. I can't keep saving you. I replied firmly. Weeks turned into months, and I settled into a new routine. I found solace in the simplicity of my new life. Carol's incessant calls were easy to ignore, each one more shrill and panic-stricken than the last. One morning, while I sipped my coffee, I received a knock on the door. Opening it, I was surprised to see Bradley standing there, looking more disheveled than I had ever seen him. Bradley, what are you doing here? I asked, keeping my surprise in check. I... I need help, he mumbled, looking at his feet. Come in, I said, stepping aside. He shuffled in, looking around the small, tidy apartment. This place, it's different. It's mine, I replied simply. Now what's going on? Things are bad at home. Grandma's health isn't great, and Dad, he's just not handling it. Bradley said, his voice cracking. Bradley, you know I can't go back. I needed to make a change. I know, but we're drowning. Dad's been laid off and Grandma had to sell the house. We're living in an apartment now, but it's not enough. I... I dropped out of school to work. I felt a pang of sympathy but kept my expression neutral. Bradley, that's not the answer. You need to take responsibility, but not like this. He looked at me, eyes pleading. What should I do then? How do I fix this? You start from the bottom, Bradley. Get a job, finish your education, and understand what it means to be responsible. It takes time, but it's the only way. 
I know I treated you horribly. I was wrong. I need to make things right, but I don't know how, he confessed, tears welling up in his eyes. You took the first step by coming here. The rest is up to you. If you need guidance, I'm here. But I won't solve your problems for you. Bradley nodded, wiping his eyes. Thanks, Valerie. I'll work on it. As he left, I felt a strange sense of closure. The boy who had once been my greatest source of frustration was now seeking my guidance. It wasn't revenge I wanted, but change, and it seemed like it was finally starting to happen. Later that evening, I picked up my phone and dialed Sean. Hey, we need to talk. Val, I miss you. We need you. I need you. His voice was barely above a whisper. I can't come back, Sean, but I wanted to check in. How's Bradley? He's trying. He's working and planning to go back to school. I think your leaving was a wake-up call for all of us. I'm glad to hear that, but Sean, you need to learn to manage without me. I know, I'm learning slowly, but I am. As I hung up, I felt a sense of accomplishment. My departure had forced change, real change. It wasn't instant, but it was happening. A small smile crept onto my face. The journey wasn't over, but for the first time I felt like I had made a real difference. As weeks turned into months, I heard less from Sean and more about their struggles through mutual friends. It seemed reality had finally caught up with them. One evening, I got a call from an old friend who had run into Sean at the grocery store. Valerie, I saw Sean today. He looked terrible, asked if you knew he lost his job, she said. The news hit me, but I stayed calm. Thanks for letting me know. How's Bradley? Doing his best, from what Sean said, working part-time and trying to finish school, she replied. Good to hear, I said, trying to mask my concern. The next day I got a call from Sean himself. His voice was strained. Valerie, things have gotten worse. I don't know what to do. What happened, Sean? I got laid off, Val. We can't keep up with the expenses. Carol's health is declining and Bradley's trying, but it's not enough, he said, defeat ringing in his tone. This was never supposed to happen, he continued. I thought we could handle this. Sean, you have to take control. Talk to your mother. Set boundaries. It's the only way. But she won't listen to me. She never did. She has to now, or you'll all suffer the consequences, I replied firmly. I'll try, he said, though he didn't sound convinced. Time passed and the storm continued to rage at their end. One evening I decided to take a walk. Fresh air always cleared my mind. As I passed by my old neighborhood, I saw Bradley working at the local car wash. He looked worn out but focused. Hey, Bradley, I called out. He looked up, surprised but pleased to see me. Valerie, hey. How's it going, I asked, genuinely curious. It's tough, he admitted, but I'm managing, trying to save up and finish high school. I'm proud of you for sticking it out, I said. Thank you, he replied, gratitude in his eyes. I realized I took a lot for granted. I should have listened to you sooner. It's never too late to change, I said. Keep working hard and things will get better. He nodded, determination etched on his face. I will. Walking back, I felt a strange mixture of emotions. I cared for them, but I also knew they needed this struggle to truly understand the value of responsibility. A few nights later, I received another call from Sean. This time, his tone was desperate. Val, Carol's health is really bad. We had to sell the house and move into a small apartment. It's all falling apart. I'm sorry to hear that, Sean. You two made choices that led to this, I said, trying to stay firm but compassionate. Can you help, Val? Please. I don't know what else to do, he pleaded. You need to face this, Sean. Learn from it. I see that now. I see how much we relied on you, but it's too late, he said softly. You can still turn things around. Focus on Bradley and make things right with him. I will. Thank you, Val. As we ended the call, I realized their downfall was the wake-up call they needed. It was painful to see them struggle, but necessary for true change. They had to experience the consequences of their actions to learn and grow. Despite the chaos, I felt a sense of hope. Perhaps this was the beginning of a new chapter for all of us, one filled with hard-earned lessons and the promise of a better future. I was in the middle of organizing my apartment when my phone rang. I almost didn't answer it, but the name on the screen caught my eye. Sean. Valerie, I hate to ask, but I really need your help, he said, voice strained. What happened now? I asked, bracing myself. We're being evicted. I don't know where else to turn. He admitted. I took a deep breath. Sean, you ignored my warnings for years. Why do you expect me to help now? 
Please, Val, I've realized how much you did for us. We can't manage without you. You chose to ignore me, Sean. You need to face the consequences. But what about Bradley? He needs stability, he pleaded. I closed my eyes, considering. Bradley is trying to make things right, but you have to lead by example, Sean. I'll do anything. Just help us get back on our feet, he said, desperation clear in his voice. I'll think about it. But understand this, Sean. I won't be your crutch anymore. We hung up, and I felt a mix of emotions. Part of me wanted to rush in and fix everything, but I knew that wouldn't help them in the long run. A week later, I got another call from Sean. Valerie, we've found a small place we can afford, but I need a loan for the deposit. Can you help? Sean, I'll lend you the money, but this is the last time. You have to make a plan and stick to it. I promise, Val. This time will be different. We arranged to meet at a cafe to finalize the loan. As I arrived, I saw Sean sitting at a corner table, looking more worn than I'd ever seen him. Thank you for coming, he said as I sat down. I'm doing this for Bradley, I replied. Sean nodded. I understand. We'll pay you back, I swear. I handed him the check. Make sure you do, and start taking responsibility. Bradley needs you to be strong. I know. I will. Thank you, Val, he said sincerely. As I left the cafe, I hoped this would be the turning point for them. Days passed, and I focused on my own life. One afternoon, I received a call from Bradley. Valerie, can we meet? I have something to show you. Curious, I agreed. We met at a small park. Bradley looked healthier, more focused. Look, he said, showing me a report card. I passed all my classes. I'm graduating next month. Bradley, that's wonderful. I'm so proud of you, I said, genuinely happy. Thanks, Valerie. I couldn't have done it without your guidance. You did the hard work, Bradley. Keep it up. As we sat and talked, I realized how much he had grown. He was maturing into a responsible young man. How's Sean? I asked. He's trying. He's working two jobs now and managing the finances better. Good to hear. Stay on track, both of you. We will, Valerie. We've learned a lot from this, he said. Walking back to my apartment, I felt a sense of closure. They were finally learning from their mistakes, and I had played my part. A few weeks later, I got another call from Sean. Val, I wanted you to know we've paid the first month's rent on time. Things are looking up. I'm glad to hear that, Sean. Keep it up. I will. Thank you for everything. As the call ended, I felt a sense of peace. My decision to leave had been the catalyst for real change. While they still had a long way to go, they were finally on the right path. For the first time in years, I felt like I could breathe easy, knowing I had made the right choices for myself and, indirectly, for them as well. A few months passed and life carried on without much contact from Sean and Bradley. One day, while returning from the grocery store, my phone buzzed with a message from Bradley. Valerie, can you meet me at the park? Need to talk. I agreed, curious and maybe a little concerned. When I arrived, I found Bradley sitting alone on a bench, a somber look on his face. What's going on? I asked, taking a seat beside him. It's Grandma. She's not doing well. We had to sell her part of the house to pay for medical bills, he confessed, eyes downcast. I'm sorry to hear that, Bradley, I said sincerely. It's been really tough. Dad's trying, but he's stretched so thin. We're just surviving day by day. I placed a comforting hand on his shoulder. You've come a long way, Bradley. Don't lose hope. I know. It's just hard seeing everything fall apart. His voice broke. You've got to stay strong for yourself and for your dad. Thanks, Valerie. It means a lot to hear you say that. I'm always here if you need to talk, I reassured him. On my way home, I thought about Carol. She had never shown me kindness, but seeing her suffer now didn't bring me joy either. This was karma playing out in real life, teaching its harsh lessons. A week later, Sean called me. His voice was weary. Val, it's Carol. She's bedridden now, and we have to move her to a care facility. We can't handle her medical needs. I'm sorry to hear that, I replied, trying to balance empathy with my own emotional distance. Any advice on what we can do? Look into community resources. There are programs that can help you manage financially and medically. I will. Thanks, Val. I appreciate it, he said, his voice sincere. A month later, as I was strolling through town, I ran into an old neighbor, who told me Carol had moved into a small apartment near the care facility. The news left me feeling a strange mix of vindication and pity. One rainy afternoon, I stopped by the local diner for a coffee. As I entered, I saw Bradley cleaning tables. 
He looked up and smiled when he saw me. Valerie, hey. Hey, Bradley. How's it going? Better. Dad got a more stable job, and I'm working here part-time while finishing high school. I'm glad to hear that. Keep working hard. I will. Thanks for everything, Val, he said earnestly. As I left the diner, I bumped into Sean. He looked older, more worn, but there was a glimmer of hope in his eyes. Valerie, he said, his tone softer than I remembered. Sean, I replied, keeping my emotions in check. I wanted to thank you. Your leaving made us wake up. We're still struggling, but at least we're trying now. I'm glad to hear that. You know, Sean, it's never too late to change. He nodded. We're learning that the hard way. As we stood there, the rain pouring around us, I felt the closure I had longed for finally settling in. The Turner family had learned their lessons through the trials they'd faced, and while it had been a difficult journey, it was clear they were on a path to redemption. Take care, Sean, I said, turning to leave. You too, Val, he replied, his voice carrying a sense of genuine appreciation. Walking away, I felt lighter. The drama and chaos that once filled my life had dissipated, leaving room for new beginnings. Bradley's growth, Sean's newfound responsibility, and even Carol's change of circumstances were all part of the greater tapestry of life's lessons learned. For the first time in a long while, I felt at peace, knowing my decisions had steered not just me, but all of us, towards a better future.